Welcome, welcome, welcome to the ep- to the new episode of We Wait Air. This is going to be a record-breaking episode. We have all eight beautiful people with us here. Uh, this is so much excited. You can see Edward is super excited, and uh, it, this is going to be super great. And uh, this is going to be the final single-digit episode. This is a very important information because the next one will be a double-digit one. Um, so with us, we have like a really great crew, some new faces. So. Uh, you can see, for example, Hokun, Nesrin, and Ricardo, uh, who are uh, our special guests who are participated in a really cool hackathon that we organized in Berlin. So they'll be demoing some projects. And, uh, you know, the usual uh, suspects, you have Dan and JP who talk to us about cool stuff. And uh, Etienne, our CTO, was like an, a cool announcement. So thank you for spending your time and for watching uh, Vivid Air. Like, we're always excited to see you and uh, to have you you know, be part of this show. Um, so thank you for watching and listening. And, you know, if you want to help us a little bit, give us a like. Uh, that always helps because then the video will pop up in more places and uh, that always helps. It's always nice. Um, but most importantly, because you are with us live, what you can do that you can't do when you watch it later is you could ask questions, right? So feel free to ask questions. So as you ask questions, I will be sharing them with uh, our audience here. So whoever is talk- talking about a given topic, I can always ask these questions to them. Um, you know, like keep it civil, of course, right? Like I'm not going to ask uh, two bad questions, although like uh, the saying goes like there are no bad questions, just uh, stupid answers. Um, so that's it. And um, yeah, super excited to have you here. So what are we going to talk about today is uh, first we'll open up with a multi-tenant update. So uh, next week, Thursday, we're actually planning the next release for Weaviate, that which was going to be Weaviate 120. And the multi-tenancy is a huge feature for us. Uh, so Etienne will talk about it. Um, I already mentioned the MLOps hackathon uh, that we did in Berlin. So I would like to talk a little bit about it, but more importantly, I would like to share, you know, we would like to share with you the, the, the winning three projects. Uh, so that's why we have our special guests here. Um, then later on, Edward, um, our new ad- arrival. Wait, Edward, I didn't introduce you, right? Damn, I'm so terrible. No. Yes, Edward, welcome Edward. He's a, he's a new arrival at Weavit. Oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. Ooh. Um, maybe that's because you're a cat person and I'm a dog person, you know, like, you know, that was on purpose. Uh, but yeah, Edward actually built a pretty cool demo and he really wants to share it with us. Um, and uh, it's actually a really, really interesting way of using WeVid as well. So uh, uh, we're happy to have you here, uh, even if, you, if I miss you to begin with. Um, then we want to talk to you about this new thing we introduced, uh, which is like the WeVid Forum leaderboard. So for those of you that uh, are, you know, good contributors, uh, you definitely can see your name higher up. And uh, there's some rumors that I may be buying uh, bottles of nice things to people that, uh, you know, are tough contributors. At the very least, you know, like uh, if we stay civil, I- I'll send you like one of those amazing Weavy t-shirts or maybe some other swag. Um, JP will talk to us about the Weavy Academy, which is uh, pretty cool. And uh, who knows, maybe, you know, if anyone likes meerkats, maybe somebody can help me name my wooden meerkat because this is Vasily. He already has a name, Vasily or Vasco. Um, but uh, the wooden guy doesn't have a name yet. So maybe we have time at the end. So uh, also drop us in comments, uh, say hi, like say hi, where you watch from, or just ask questions. And I'm super pumped uh, to have you here. And we already have the first comments. Uh, from like some other u- usual suspects. So Connor, Packed House, of course, Go Team Go. Yeah, thanks, Erica. So without any further ado, I'd like to basically pass on the microphone to Etienne uh, and tell us what is this all multi-tenancy about? Like, why are we so excited? Because uh, like, in- even like when we talked about it at first, I was like, all right, so what do we even mean by multi-tenancy? Like, why do we want that? So, Etienne, the floor is yours. Yeah, gladly, gladly. So thanks for, for having me, especially in this packed episode. I'll, I'll try to keep it short. And, and also hi to Connor and Erica, who just popped up. Like, usually it's the other way around. They, they would say hi to me on the episode. So that's nice. Um, yay. <laughs> okay, <yeah>. hi. <laughs> um, so multi-tenancy is uh, one of those sort of very special moments in VV8 history. I think we, we had a couple feature-wise where... where um, we would introduce something new, 
that that somehow changes how you interact with VV8, or at least gives you the ability to to do new things with VV8 that you couldn't do before. And multi-tenancy is is one of them. So first of all, what what do we mean by multi-tenancy? Like multi-tenancy in general is the the idea of sharing some kind of resources for multiple tenants. So the name is basically like you would have maybe a, an apartment building, and then multiple people would rent an apartment in that apartment building. They would be tenants from the perspective of the of the building owner. And if you rent an apartment, you have some strict isolation requirements. You don't want to sort of share your apartment with your neighbor unless you maybe invite them over or something. But in general, you, you, you like that you can lock your door and you have this kind of isolation uh, requirement. Nevertheless, some things in there are shared. So for example, the heating system in the building might be shared. And, and um, this is kind of what this is about, like making sure that um, individual tenants have their own sort of their own space can do with the deal with their own things, um, but at the same time they still live in the same building. And and this is exactly the same kind of concept for VV8. So for a multi-tenancy case, you would have a single VV8 cluster. So it's not single in a single instance, but a single cluster, sort of a single deployment. For example, if you sign up to the WCS, that would be sort of your your VV8 instance. And then you can host multiple tenants on there. And a tenant could be so so for example, if your app has, let's say you have an app for note taking and um, your your users basically would be your tenants. And it makes sense that that unless certain users actively share their documents, if they search through their documents, they want to share, uh, want to search through their own documents or the documents of their own organization, but not like if we as a business, the note taking app would have three competing businesses, like you definitely don't want those competitors to be able to, to search through each, each other's documents. So that's kind of the idea around multi-tenancy. And this this concept, of course, is nothing new. Like for a SaaS business, it's completely normal to have multiple different users and have these kind of isolation requirements. Uh, but the way that we could do this in VV8 is completely new because before it's, and, and now we can say that because now we, we have the proper solution. Before it was basically just workarounds. You could use this, for example, using classes because a class already is a, an isolation unit in VV8. So you could just have one class per tenant. And this is this is the, the approach that we recommended up until now. Works okay, gives you the best sort of, of, of um, yeah, the best isolation requirements and everything, but maybe two to 5,000 tenants is the most that you could run on a, on a cluster. And also just adding more nodes to the cluster didn't really help there because there, there were sort of these central constraints because in the end, it, it was just the workaround. But now with the native multi-tenancy feature, uh, we can actually support millions of tenants and every single one of those tenants could on their own have millions of objects. So so basically it's it's easy to go into the, the billion or trillion scale of, of objects and still keep these kind of isolation requirements. And something that's extremely important and extremely cool about this, in, in my opinion, is the fact that you're sort of never locked in. Like you can dynamically grow your VV8 cluster by simply adding nodes. Or if you're on the, on the VV8 cloud service, then you won't even know that then basically our system in the background will just add more notes. You you won't even um, won't even notice. So um, in our, our initial load test that we did, I think we were able to to run fifty thousand tenants on a single note, and the exact number that varies depending on how how um, how much data you have per tenant, um, how, how many fields, how this is structured, etc. There are basically a couple of, of hard limits that that on, on something that a single machine can host, which is sort of the whole idea of cloud and distributed setups and, and sort of horizontal scaling. And um, yeah, with, with 50,000, so you could keep this on a single node as you grow your business and onboard more users. And then at some point, if it's too much, you just add a, sing a second node and then you have more capacity for another 50,000 and so on. And this basically scales linearly. And that's, that's extremely important because that means sort of the whole VV8 mindset already, like if you look at our pricing model, for example, that is already a pay as you grow kind of model. And now we also have the architecture that, that uh, works for that as well. So basically infinite scaling, infinite linear scaling with uh, multi-tenancy. Um, from a user's perspective, super easy to use. It's basically just one new field that is added. That's basically just the, the name of the tenant, which you would probably have had before in, in one way or another anyway. You would have maybe had a, a field in your schema and then maybe set a filter or you would have uh, had a, a part of your class name. So super easy to use. Everything will stay the same. The only difference basically is that, and, and multi-tenancy is opt-in. So if you don't have a multi-tenancy case, you don't have to use it. But if you do, then you should specify the, the tenant key. And um, yeah, basically use VB8 as is, the, the, the rest stays the same. So it would be super easy to, to use as well. And um, 
yeah, it will scale very well with the number of tenants. It will also, the, the kind of isolation, this is something where a technical requirement and a business requirement or, or a functional requirement uh, come together. So for example, something that we hear very, very often, especially in, in Europe or, or in, in uh, Japan that also came up more, but it's also more in, in the US um, is, um, so, so the Europe, European one is a GDPR, but other kind of isolation requirements as well, where deletion plays a big role. So for example, offboarding of, of tenants. And this is something that, that you typically don't think about in your business cases because you think about sort of onboarding new users and you don't want to think about losing them. Um, but one sort of technical case that we see very often is, for example, if you have a free trial. Um, if you have a free trial that would expire, let's say after two weeks or so. Now, if you have a marketing event or something else happen or your app goes viral on social media and you suddenly get a massive spike in signups, that's awesome. So that's that's one thing that multi-tenancy can handle. Just add more notes if you if you um, if you can't <laughs> sort of handle it with the existing infrastructure. But now out of those maybe tens of thousands of users that all signed up on the same day, that also means their trial will all end up the same day. And while we of course wish you that every single one of your free users converts into a paying user, we know that that's, that's not the case. So uh, with an like, insanely high conversion rate of 10%, that would still mean that 90% of users are offboarded. And this, this sounds trivial. This sounds like, okay, then let's just delete 90%. But from a technical perspective, it's extremely important to make sure that those 90% of users dropping off don't have a negative impact on your paying and, and, and staying users. And this is something where if you, if you don't have this kind of technical level isolation, that can easily happen because in modern system, deletes are often just done using flags and then something else happens in the background and you have these async processes to clean it up and that's actually very similar with, with vector search as well so being sure that you can essentially say removing a tenant is as simple as deleting a file from disk and then it's gone that is super helpful from a technical perspective but also for these kind of compliance things like gdpr where you maybe have to prove that if a user says i want all my personal data gone then you can prove that you can do this in a certain time frame and that's that's sort of um, yeah to, to wrap up where I started. It is one of those big features where so many things are coming together, and we can see this community demand. So so shout out to um, to Yuri who was here on the on the VV8 Air. Uh, maybe he's watching. <laughs> so hi, um, he was here a couple of episodes ago. Um, who had I think probably the first multi tenancy case that 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 we were aware of. Um, it it come it came up very often in our community Slack and now the forums are like, hey, how do I separate my, my workflows from multi-tenancy? So it's a clear sort of community-driven one. It's, of course, also v 8 is a business and v 8 needs to make money. So v 8 also has commercial uh, users. This is something that there comes up more and more and it combines or if it makes sense from a technical perspective and it, it uh, allows for these compliant things. So it's, this is basically what I meant, like something where, where everything comes together and I'm super proud of the solution that our team has built because it's something that that scales very well, that makes sense, that is very sound and sort of very future proof for multi-tenancy, let's say. Nice. Um, so just to wrap up as well, like um, what, what is like the main use case? Like uh, is because my idea of it was always like, hey, what if I build a business and then like I need to like have a separate collection per customer or something? Is that the idea why we need multi-tenancy or are there other use cases? That, that is the, the primary one. Like from a, the, the technical infrastructure, you could use that for different things as well. You could use it, for example, for say in a time series, um, when you say like you have data uh, that lives for, or, or you, you add data every week and you have a retention period of 52 weeks, you could basically treat that as a multi-tenancy case. You could say one week is a tenant, you have 52 tenants. And once you grow, build it beyond uh, 52, you just delete the oldest tenant. So it also allows for these kind of things, but they're more sort of, th th those are not the primary use case. The primary use cases are really, as a business, you have multiple users and those users can upload documents or whatever they have to VV8 and it needs to be isolated to them. Like the, you need to make sure that user A never sees the documents of user B. And also it needs, needs to make sure that, for example, if user A has a lot of traffic and they're hosted on the same machine, that user B still has dedicated resources or still has, has um, sort of, you can still keep their throughput up so that you have, don't have this kind of interference even though they're on the same, same setup. 
And of course, also cost savings. Like you could, of course, also say that for multi-tenancy, well, I could just deploy maybe one VVA cluster per tenant, but just think of million tenants, then, then you're bound to have some kind of overhead. And if you pool these things and still get the, the isolation requirements then or the isolation capabilities, then it's way easier to, to save on your infrastructure bill, we, we, which you don't have to care about if you use the VVA cloud service, but of course you can also self-host it and then, then you do. Nice, nice. Um... We have two messages from the community. First of all, Gift uh, says, uh, good to be here. It's a gift to have you here, Gift. Um, pun intended. Uh, sorry, uh, I couldn't help myself. And uh, Jürgen is saying, yeah, the leading specific content is very helpful, not just per tenant, though. Good to hear about this feature. So very nice. Yes. Thank you. Um, also, if anyone has any questions, uh, now is the time. Because uh, I know Etienne is very busy and you have to disappear soon. So, yeah. yeah. Any questions here? If someone wants to uh, find out more about this feature, is there a place they could go to perhaps to get more information? There is. Uh, we've released a, a blog post um, about a week ago. And, and of course, there, there will be uh, much more once the, the final release is out. But for now, basically, the, the teaser with a couple of, of more example use cases uh, with, with the kind of technical features, like what makes the feature great from a technical perspective, that's all in there. So um, yeah, I think Sebastian will put the link in the description. That's, that, that sounds so youtube -y, the link in the description. <laughs> can, I, can, can I also ask for people to smash the like button and subscribe, please? Yeah, of course we should do it. Um, so the link uh, I, I'm sharing here on the screen, but there's also in the description of the video, uh, you can find all sort of links in there and this being one of them. Yeah. So this was not a planted question. Not at all. <laughs> Actually, we didn't rehearse that. So that's fine. Perfect. Exactly. Perfect. Uh, I see a couple of uh, more uh, responses. So uh, I see Gift. I uh, appreciate my, my joke. That's very nice. Thank you. And uh, Erica already smashed it. Very nice. With capital mm -hmm. letters. So um, I was like, I should shout, but I don't want to do that. <laughs> Very nice. Um, yeah, this, this is awesome. This is super exciting. Uh, so my this understanding is that this is going to be ready with in Weviet from Thursday next week. And in WCS, do we know when this is going to land in WCS? Same, same day. Same we'll, day, perfect. Same day, yes. You'll be able to use it right away. And um, if you have an existing... Uh, um, Sort of running machine on on, v, uh, on the WCS, you can just upgrade it using the automated upgrade feature. If you start a new one, it will always start with the latest version, so you would already have it, and then you can add your multi-tenancy classes. By the way, also in combination with non-multi-tenancy classes, so that's and it also supports cross-references. So there's there's lots of lots of sort of things that we have to think about, but they they will all work. <laughs> and if not, then let us know. Then we'll make them work. <laughs> Nice. This is this is exciting. Uh, really cool. And um, also, you can learn more about it in the blog post that we shared a link for. Uh, but also, as, if you're interested in the 120 release, uh, uh, JP and Dan here they're, they're actually working on a release blog post. So that's also going to go live on Thursday. Uh, so definitely check out our uh, blogs page. Um, let me see if I can show a quick banner for it. Uh, so if you're new to WV8, this is where all our blogs are. Come on, show it. So uh, definitely check it out uh, on Thursday next week. But you should be checking it every week anyway, because we always have cool, awesome content. Um, perfect. I don't see any more questions for Etienne. Uh, Etienne, thanks for, uh, for joining us for the session and uh, for the great explanation. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Congrats on, on episode nine on the ninth birthday. Yeah, the <laughs> final single digit episode. The final right? single digit episode. I feel very honored to be part of this this final single digit episode. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Vasco says hi. Hi back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Take care. Bye. Oh, you can stay. <laughs> I'm not kicking you out. <laughs> All right. On that on that note, uh, the next topic we have is the MLOps hackathon that we did last uh, last week. Yeah, that was last week um, in Berlin. Well, depending how you measure time. So basically, this is this is a pretty exciting thing because first of all, there's this amazing community called like the like the MLOps community, uh, and um, 
I was talking to Demetrius, who's like one of the founders of, of that community. Uh, and we're like, hey, how about we do some, you know, events and hackathons uh, together? And uh, he basically said that Berlin is a ve- is, is an excellent place to start because there's like some amazing engineers in there. Uh, there's a really cool vibe. And who doesn't want to go to Berlin anyway, right? Um, so we kind of spent some time preparing it. And uh, long story short, uh, we ended up with like... Um, like a two day sort of uh, event where first day was kind of like, hey, let's meet and greet on Friday. Everybody gets to know each other, you know, get some pizza and stuff. There was, we're supposed to have barbecue, uh, but it was raining like hell. Uh, so we ended up, you know, getting some takeout, like uh, delivered, et cetera, which is still cool. Like everybody, you know, had fun. Uh, but then on Saturday we had, if I remember correctly, about 60 people uh, that were divided in, uh, I think 19 or 20 teams. Uh, hacking on various different projects and then by the end of the day we had 19 submissions all built with VV8 um, like with OpenAI, with Cohere and a bunch of other things, really cool ideas uh, of those 19, 16 were actually working demos which was pretty awesome, uh, there was a few uh, demos that didn't but you know, that's part of the game. Uh, and then uh, eventually we had the, like three winners, uh, three winning teams. So that's why we have here uh, Nasreen Hoken and Ricardo. And um, what I'd like to do is actually give them an opportunity uh, to share their projects. Like, so maybe a quick intro of who they are, what they built, and then maybe demo what, what they did. So uh, we will start uh, with Nasreen. Uh, hey, Nasreen, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. Of course. So you had project in it, right? What can you tell us about it? Yeah. So um, in this project, I did a coding assistant, which creates code based on user prompt and based on user given libraries. Because uh, I'm a data scientist, and every day, every day at my data science job, I feel like I'm confronted with a new library that I need to. Um, use. So I thought about creating this coding agent which uh, takes a library from from a user and then creates code based on that library. And also um, this is because current LLMs like ChatGPT and GPT-4 and so on uh, have been trained on a pretty old uh, corpus and as we know libraries appear almost uh, on a monthly basis, and uh, these LLMs can't catch up. So the idea was to prov- provide um, the, these uh, LLMs with fresh documentation and to generate code, code based on that. Cool, cool. So uh, should we share your screen and then you could uh, run a quick demo for us? Yes. That would be amazing. So here's your screen. So walk us yeah. through, uh, through that demo. Okay, so let's explore the user interface. So basically what we have here in the middle is the, uh, the, prompt, the prompt, so the coding task that's going to be given by the user. And uh, here we have the libraries that are going to be used to generate the code. So in this uh, project, I have provided the VB8 library and the LangChain library. And especially because LangChain is quite a new library and you cannot find any uh, support on that with uh, current LLM models. So you basically enter your coding prompt here and then click on generate. And what's going to happen is that on the left side, you're going to see the the plan for the code, which is going to then be um, transformed into code uh, that you're going to see on the right. And this code is going to be executed and uh, the error logs are going to be shown in this console in the in the bottom. So for example, here I have this coding prompt using the LangChain library, uh, write code for an agent that gives weather information based on a user given city. And what I have here in the coding plan is in the first uh, line, I always have the uh, the dependencies that I'm going to need for the project, and I'm going to later talk why why this is necessary. And then there's uh, a a generated plan for this coding task. So in the beginning, defining uh, the the, uh, weather info function, um, using the LangChain library to create this agent, 
using the agent to generate the query for the weather API and sending the uh, request to the weather API and so on. So it seems like a very reasonable workflow. And uh, we're going to see the, um, the result of the coding agent here. So it's going to import uh, some libraries and uh, it has this, um, this code, which was generated based on the plan. And um, how this actually works is shown here. Um, so uh, what happens is that the, um, the documentation for the libraries are downloaded uh, as HTML, and these documents are parsed and chunked and embedded into, uh, in the Reviate Vector database. And when, the, uh, when we get a coding prompt from the user, this coding prompt is also embedded and then we do a semantic search and we retrieve uh, the most relevant documents from the uh, Reviate uh, Vector database. And we give this um, to the planning agent. So basically in this project, there are four agents, which uh, each, each one of them is going to take care of a certain task. So the planning agent is going to um, generate the code plan, which is going to be given to a dependency agent. And as we have seen in the plan, if the first line is always the, um, the, the libraries that need to be installed. So the dependency agent is going to extract these libraries and uh, these are going to be then uh, installed into a virtual environment. Then this code uh, generates the coding plan from the planning agent together with the context, which is the relevant documents which we have retrieved, are going to be given to a coding agent, which is going to generate the code. And this code is going to be run into this virtual environment where we have already installed the dependencies. And um, this code is usually going to contain some mistakes. So we will get these errors and we'll give all of these uh, information, the context on the source code and give all that to a code correcting agent, which is going to keep track of all of these errors and with each iter iteration uh, is going to correct the code and uh, get the errors and so on until a certain limit that is defined by the user of uh, coding attempts is reached. And uh, we can see how this goes in action. So I can give here a prompt, like if you want to use the Weviate uh, library, um, write code that um, embeds documents and uh, queries and save them into deviate, then queries them um, based on the user prompt. Or maybe let's say, yeah. This is the so, model we've, we've all been waiting for, the live demo. This is exciting. Yes. Uh, so it, it takes a little bit of time because it's going to generate a plan and then it's going to install the libraries and then it's going to run the code. But actually, if, if we're lucky enough, we can see how it is generating different versions of the code. And so what we have here is on the left, the, uh, the plan, and we can see here it imported the Weaviate client with this dash, and the error is that this is uh, an incorrect syntax. So hopefully in the next iteration is going to correct that um, issue. This is epic. It's actually trying to figure things out step by step. Um, just to add some encouragement, looks like Connor is very excited. Like a uh, huge congr congratulations. This is the best example I've seen so far of this idea. Um, and uh, if, if you don't know Connor, Connor 
sees and knows everything that's going on in the ML space. So if he if he believes this is the best example, I think this is uh, this is a good uh, message to hear. Um, thanks, Amit. Uh, we all think this is pretty awesome as well. Yeah. So one of the next steps for this. So mm -hmm. the problem is that this is even though it's giving given documentation, it usually like hallucinates some of the module imports and some of the function um, function parameters and so on. So I'm currently creating, so I, I want to create a code base that is uh, extracted, a code based knowledge graph that is extracted from the library. And that's going to be also given to the, to the agent so that they can verify if the module imports and the function parameters and so on are all correct based on the not only the, on the documentation but also on the uh, on the code base from the library nice this is cool um, i have a question because we have like uh, at weebie we've created this uh, repository of recipes um mm -hmm. like unfortunately erica is not on the call but we have this like there's a bunch of jupyter notebooks is that something maybe that you could ingest as like hey here's a loads of examples on how to do stuff with Wigate. Yes, I think all of these sources of information are very valuable for, for the, yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. And I've seen also some research that also take information from Stack Overflow and all examples. So, so for, for the learning, um, for for a learning from a learning perspective, I think that's very valuable. Nice, yeah. Because I guess the idea is like the more good examples we can provide um, to the machine, right, to figure out the code, the better. And uh, we can already see Erica excited about this idea, right? Like, uh, and any place that we could use recipes, right, Erica? <laughs> So uh, no, that that would be exciting. Uh, I would definitely, I would definitely share with you the links uh, to the recipes if you want to have like another iteration. It'd be kind of cool to figure out how to do it. Um, Perfect. Yeah. J JP, yeah, you're here. You could also say it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt, but the, but those recipes are really really cool, and I think uh, people at the hackathon um, really appreciated having them to as a starting point and and building on them, obviously as well. Yeah. That's awesome. Cool, cool. I have one question from Connor. So uh, I'm going to move you higher so that you're visible. I'm not that important. Uh, so retrieving from Stack Overflow, uh, overflow particularly for the, that code correct, correcting agent part is super interesting. Curious how you are thinking about the Wibit schema design for this. Um, mm. So Not sure if you're an expert when it comes to the the, the schema, I would say, mm -hmm. um, and, and that could be still a tricky topic. I have started doing the uh, code-based knowledge graph with the schemas so that you have oh. like a knowledge graph from a whole code base where you can link the folder structure and the modules and the classes, the functions and the parameters and so on. And um, then, then these should be checked, uh, or the, the agent should be able to query those to verify the the, the module imports and all that kind of stuff. But also how to uh, how to include these examples from Stack Overflow and everything. What I've seen is that people use that information as description, which they store for. Uh, for these different parameters and modules and stuff like that. So that hmm. provides further information for um, for the other one. I see. That's interesting. Interesting. Yeah, definitely a cool project to explore deeper, right? And uh, uh, go go deeper into it. Yeah. Cool. This is uh, this was a pretty cool demo. Like I'm super excited to see it uh, running live and like the code plan was updating. I saw that the, the code itself got updated as you went. And this, this is super cool. Like we could do a whole episode probably on each of the demos that we want to show today. Um, but yeah, thanks for uh, for this demo. Um, this is super cool. Thanks for having me. It was such a great hackathon, I must say.
Yeah. Well, uh, next next uh, next hackathon we do like we'll definitely be using one of your well, like your project and uh, the other projects as examples of like what to aspire to. So yeah, thanks for setting the bar pretty high. <laughs> Cool. So next up, the bar is pretty high. Hokun, uh, you're the next one to talk to us about the project BGB for all. Yeah. So let me I, know when you want me to share a screen. But what's the project about? What was the idea? Well, yeah, maybe it's better that I share screen to to like uh, introduce this idea. Okay. All right. Let's so. Do that. Yeah, I'm Ho Kun. I'm from Tio Berlin as a research associate. I work here. And our team basically incorporates three foreigners who are no Germans and one German. So the problem we want to serve basically is how we can use large language model and also vector, uh, vector database VVA to solve problems which might be encountered by foreigners in daily life. And this one comes from our site, BGB. Well, probably you have no idea about this one. It's basically the civil code for German, for Germany. And it has 336 pages. And cover things about like uh, the contract issues when you sign a contract, how should you end the contract or whether your contract is illegal or not. Uh, in order to understand this uh, law, you probably need to read all the pages, which is 300. And maybe you are lucky that you can understand and solve your problem. But it might be hard, especially for foreigners with, like me, have no much knowledge about German. And because of the large language model, like ChatGPT, is very um, powerful at understanding um, this context. However, um, to accurately retrieve this knowledge, this uh, law is not that easy. Therefore, we um, use uh, VV8 to help us ingest those, uh, uh, this law by uh, basically chunk this book. Uh, into several uh, small uh, parts. And then when we uh, ask a question about specific things like uh, our rent contract, then um, the, our uh, assistant will retrieve the corresponding chapter from the uh, BGB and then summarize with the uh, source to the user so they can uh, without reading the book and understand the law and how they should react. So too much talk. Let's see how it works. If hey, it works. Uh, Hokun, you're doing great, by the way. Like, honestly, to me, even if you uh, have a book that is written in your native language, like uh, already that is a difficult hurdle to go and find the information. Like, it's it's in, impossible, and then yeah, I agree. Like if it's a foreign language, that that's even worse. Like uh, and me being Polish, living in Denmark right now, I feel the pain. You know, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. I can. I think many people can relate, especially my colleague, colleague today. <laughs> when he see, uh, so I basically tell about this uh, podcast today and uh, tell him the idea, and he specifically point out that I should emphasize that there are already 20% of people in Germany are foreigners. And probably most of them don't have the native speaking ability of German. So yeah. I think that's a big demand. I think so, yeah. And, and, and I also know that German is quite bureaucratic, right? So there's like not many ways around it. Like you really need to know this, uh, these rules and everything. And being able to find uh, the, the information is just tough. So uh, yeah, exactly. Show, yeah. So uh, yeah. let's let's see what we can do because I've seen the demo live <laughs> and I remember I was super excited. But uh, yeah, yeah. Let's see yeah. if it works this time. <laughs> okay. Can my so, for example, inspect my apartment without noticing? Interesting. Yeah. For example, I'm quite curious about this question, <laughs> like which might be haunted in our daily life. And what is uh, our assistant will do basically is to retrieve the corresponding uh, paragraph from BGB law, this book, 
and then uh, supply that to uh, GBT4 API, and then summarize with the information from the ABGB, and then with also the source. Um, so maybe we can just take a look inside. So under the hood, uh, we retrieve the law with the, the, the German <laughs> translated. But actually, I think a good feature from Vivid is that it has cross language embedding, which makes it possible even here, we just uh, query with uh, other language. We can also get the, uh, the relevant information we want. Okay, we now gather with that, let's see. So this is impossible and we can get exact the paragraph in the BGB law, why it's not allowed. And I think this is better than maybe just trying search online because yeah, definitely people have information about this, but probably they don't have exact paragraph to uh, cite to use um, to support. And as I just mentioned, maybe we can, you know, sometimes people are no good at English. We can also try using other language. Uh, I'm from China, by the way, so I will just use Chinese uh, to <laughs> ask uh, if it's possible. Well, uh, let me just paste it. So here, it means same thing as here that I want to ask if it's allowed. Well, okay, cool. <laughs> Things doesn't work this time, but you know, we have a backup. <laughs> So I asked the same question here. And we also get the like the similar answer. Uh, and the thing is that it doesn't matter whether we uh, English or Chinese, we can always get the answer we want. Uh, but probably for user-friendly concern, we can also like change the language here to to uh, like user language. And on the left side, I haven't introduced, pardon me. <laughs> this is a cool feature uh, developer and designed by Max, uh, one team member of us, that we uh, specifically uh, extract the quotes and also uh, apply uh, this translation here. And specifically this quote is cross verified from Viet to make sure this is no hallucination from uh, GPT-4 models. And we, we retrieve it directly from the VV8. And yeah, you wouldn't, you yeah, wouldn't want like a, an advice from a hallucination, right? Like, hey, can my land recover out? No. <laughs> and the hallucination is like, hey, if he needs to make the money, bye. <laughs> that would not yeah, be a exactly. response. Yeah, that's, that's why we know. want to also have the quote features. And so, in the so, future, we yeah. were like, yeah, please go ahead. Don't, so, so one thing that, the, that I, I remember during the demo you did, like you also wrote a question in Italian and you got an, a response in Italian. Is that something you can still do? Uh, well, yeah, definitely, but not this time. <laughs> okay, cool, cool. Um, I think uh, I also tried to deliver this feature as well, but like, I think, some prompts need to be like optimized to have such stability. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I think that's yeah, that's also what we want to achieve to adapt the answer to use the language. That would be awesome. Nice. And 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 I interrupted you when you said that you had like some ideas for the future. Oh uh, yeah, exactly. So in the future, we would like to open source our project and also provide it for public use. Maybe also. I think it would be very useful that we include other legal law, other um, regulations or things into the um, database reviewed so that like foreigners in Germany, they can really answer their daily questions. Maybe also update their own like contracts to see uh, if there are some like questions can be answered or so. Yeah, that sounds like a cool idea. Yeah, if you open source in one day, we could also work together on like a, create like a tutorial or something. Could be a cool collaboration. I would love that. Nice. Yeah, looking um, forward to that. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, to some uh, encouragement, so Jürgen really likes your idea. 
uh, you know, uh, chatting with law content, a dream comes true for many, have your personal lawyer on your phone and ditch the real one. You know, the joke, what are two, <laughs> 1,000 lawyers laying dead on the bottom of the sea? A good start. Nice. Um, some of, yeah, Edward appreciates the joke. So does Mark. So, yeah. Cool, cool. So there's a question for you. So how did you split the book? Would you use sentences? Oh, th pages? Th this is really a, a good question. Uh, we actually encounter some issues when we just split the book. Uh, at the beginning, I think we split just by the, the, the new lines mark, and it didn't work well. And at the end, we just uh, split it according to the, uh, the character, uh, the chunk size. I don't. I think it's still uh, um, some experiments we can work on to tune because uh, this uh, splitting could be quite an important thing for us to really retrieve the corresponding like paragraph so that the users later on can refer. And also, uh, one thing um, adding upon upon that is that uh, I think. We at the moment don't have the page or some because uh, metadata add into this apart from this uh, paragraph. At the later point, uh, I think it's also a good idea that we add such meta information such that uh, the users could really refer and cross uh, verify the source of the information. Nice, nice. Yeah. No, this is this is cool. This is cool. Uh, we should definitely uh, collaborate about on, on it in the future. Um, and uh, like there's so many ideas in terms of like how you can speed the content in a better way and uh, and it's always like depends on the on the use case right uh, so we even have a pretty interesting blog post on like ingesting pdfs and that also talks about like how you split different parts of the uh, pdf and to, to put it into an llm like through an llm so that's kind of cool cool yeah exactly um, yeah, yeah. I think we will really play an important role here because like all those books are basically, we need to be uh, split into chunks so that later on we can really retrieve relevant documents for users to check and answer their questions. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Thank you for this demo. This was super awesome. Like um, I, I really like how it's like, hey, it's not just like, hey, uh, here's a bit of data, here's how we search, but also like the application of it, it immediately resonates for with anyone that had to live uh, abroad for a bit longer than, you know, a couple of months or holidays. Um, so, yeah. And then Mark agrees. Attribution of source is critical for law. That's always important to be able to quote where something comes from. Perfect. Let's move to the final hackathon demo. Uh, Ricardo, you're up next. You feeling ready? You're on mute. Yes, uh, that's uh, the, the normal mantra, right? I still go to the office and I ask my colleagues in front of them if they can hear me. Um, so what's up, people? This is this is us, right? We I, I was joined by an amazing team of colleagues from Colombia, right? The, th the place where we, are, where we are born, where we uh, live our entire lives, and then we move to Berlin. And we build this, what we call CineScriptor. Right. CineScriptor is a tool that we, we wanted to create to enable the people to get the content they need when they need it about the things they care. Right. So let me set you an example. Uh, we have a collection of Slack messages right, from the Emirates community. Based on that Slack, there is a bunch of knowledge that people can easily access. Right. But sometimes it's just hard to get to it. Right. It's hard to get to the bottom of it. It's really difficult, many channels, many conversations, many interesting things to see. So why don't we just create a tool that enables us to search through that uh, amount of content, uh, technical conversations, uh, interesting topics, and just get everything consumed in a single video that I can easily uh, see and be entertained with it, right? So that's the idea behind what we did. So what are we using for this, right? Um, we were basically taking a, uh, taking advantage of 11 labs to generate voice, right? This is the, the kind of the thing for, for voice generation, text to speech. Giphy, because we always want to have fun. On Splash, we have to some B-roll, right? Some dramatic B-roll of the video. 
OpenAI, of course, to generate uh, the content, mediate where we store the uh, Slack uh, information, the, the history of Slack, and we just basically uh, took it to get the context. And MoviePy, this is just the library that is allowing us to create this amazing video with Python. So um, we managed to clone some voices, right? We had some fun. Uh, we had the, the, one of the, the, the main contributors in the years of the community, which is Demetrius, we took his voice and cloned him on 11 Labs, right? Which was quite fun. Um, and we also managed to put all the messages from, from these uh, public cha channels on Slack and put them on WeV8 so we were able to find approximations to our questions and the topics we were asking. Our architecture is quite simple, right? You, you make a question, you retrieve uh, from VV8 the semantic search, uh, the, then a number of possible answers. Uh, then with ChatGPT, we just give the context, uh, sorry, with GPT, we give the context and we ask, hey, can you please generate a video script uh, based on this uh, context uh, that we found? Uh, and we start generating the elements of the video, right? Generate the text to speech with, uh, uh, with the audio on 11 labs. We gather some images gather some GIFs and just merge everything together uh, like a hot tamal uh, with MoviePie, right? And then we have our video. So let's, I mean, the, the demo is, is quite uh, straightforward, right? Uh, as you see, this is what happens when you have a bunch of backend developers and machine learning engineers working together. There is no front end. Um, so we created this uh, basically command, console command, right? Where we send our prompt. We send the tone of what we want to, to, to see. Hey, Ricardo, sorry to interrupt you. Could no, you just, like, make the screen a bit bigger, like a command, maybe command plus a few times? Yeah, yes. That be better. Yes. Thank you. Perfect, perfect. And then after, after doing that, uh, it will just uh, start doing... Oops, wait. Give me just a second. Because you need quotations. So what's start, the idea? What is AI? And then you want to have it funny. Funny, in yes. A funny tone, nice. If we start querying VV8, right, for the data to get the context, after querying VV8, it will create the script with a GPT. Then it will, based on the script, we're going to start getting a relevant images and relevant um, a GIFs uh, for this to, to be successful, for this video to be engaging. Uh, so here we can see uh, already the script. That it was generated, right? Um, and and we we are going to start seeing and processing that and getting the each one of the elements. Now this process might take a lot of time, right? So I want to jump ahead and see a finished product uh, right now. Um, we have this video here. I don't know if I have audio though. Let's try. Uh, and let me see. Can you guys listen? No, we can't hear. Maybe if you can put it on your speaker. Something. Let me, let me, is it possible for me to reshare uh, just a second because I saw the option to share my screen audio, but I, I think I didn't check that box. Yeah, let's do it. Living, living dangerously. Give me just a second. Um, yeah, the audio is pretty important, right? Because then, uh, then you can hear that the voiceover that goes yes. over the script. Yeah, the demo at the hackathon was amazing. It was so good. So I'm looking forward to uh Hearing this, hearing so Dem Demetrius again, you know, can never have too much of Demetrius. So you guys are listening now to my audio, apparently. So let's let's see it. No, it's I'm not there. coming through. Oh. It's not coming through. Wait, keep playing. Yeah, nothing. I think you're just getting it in your headset. This is. Not so fun. This is the, the hardest part. I, this is the thing that I'm not missing about remote work. I love remote work, but this is always difficult. <laughs> uh, hey, what, what we maybe can do is if we have like one of the outputs, we could publish it somewhere to YouTube and then we could share it with, with our audience. Um, that would be great. Watch it on their own time. But maybe you could just scroll through like the video because at least the visual part is generated mm. there. But you can also um, uh, present video files in, in mm. like instead of sharing your screen you can also share a video file like at least for me i have the option to do a video file yeah let but... me try that that sounds like an interesting interesting way to do it give me just a second well spotted edward if all else fails maybe one of us can do a live narration just pretend it's ai 
but nobody else has cool voices. Uh, uh. I like to believe that I have a cool voice, though. Um, I share it, though. Uh, it, maybe do you see it, uh, Sebastian, or, or not? Yes. Here. And welcome back are. to another exciting video on our channel. Today, we're diving deep into the world of artificial intelligence. Buckle up, because we're about to take you on a wild ride. Now, you might be wondering, what exactly is artificial intelligence? Well, let me break it down for you in my own quirky way. Artificial intelligence, or AI for short, refers to the development of systems that have the ability to display intelligent behavior by analyzing their environment and taking actions to achieve specific goals. Think of it as giving machines a brain and teaching them how to make decisions. Pretty mind-blowing, right? <laughs> but hold on, before we go any further, let me just say that I won't be throwing any external URLs your way. Nope, nope, not today. We're keeping it all fun and informative right here. Now AI is all about adding complexity to simple tasks. It takes something simple, like making a sandwich, and turns it into a mind-boggling process. Who needs a plain old peanut butter and jelly when you can have AI whip up a gourmet feast for you? But let me tell you, AI isn't just about sandwiches and gourmet meals. It's about applying ancient Chinese philosophy, too. Yep, you heard me right. Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism have joined the AI party. Apparently, these philosophies help explain why some Chinese philosophers aren't as alarmed about AI as their Western counterparts. Who knew AI could be so zen? But wait, there's more. We've got a little something called the Phoenix Project. No, it's not about mythical creatures rising from the ashes. It's a business novel that explores the application of DevOps principles in an IT context. Trust me, it's a must-read for anyone who cares about the flow of work in their organization. And no worries, I won't be sharing any external URLs, but you can find the book on a popular online marketplace. Now here's the thing. AI isn't just about the tools and the technical side of things. It's about integrating people and breaking down those silos. Just like in DevOps, we need to focus on collaboration and communication. So if you're an IT person working with AI, don't forget to reach out and connect with the ML folks who need your infrastructure and tools. It's all about teamwork, people. But hold on. We've got a concern here, folks. There's something called shadow AI floating around. Research groups are skipping the IT departments and going straight to the end product bodies. This leads to small and ineffective AI environments within organizations. We need to bridge the gap and make sure that everyone is on the same page. IT folks, reach out to your AI counterparts and let's work together to achieve greatness. And there you have it, a whirlwind tour through the world of artificial intelligence. We've covered the basics, explored ancient philosophies, and peeked into the world of the Phoenix Project. But before we wrap things up, I want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us today. We hope you had as much fun as we did. If you want to see more entertaining and informative videos like this, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and click the notification bell. We've got tons of exciting content coming your way. Until next time, stay curious, stay awesome, and keep embracing the wondrous world of artificial intelligence. Signing off your quirky AI assistant. That's basically it. <laughs> <laughs> I am sold. The uh, Weavid Air episode 10 will be auto-generated. Mm -hmm. Just play it. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, we have so, some good comments. This is insane. <laughs> plus, plus, you know. Plus, plus always is a, is a good comment. Nice. Stay <laughs> cute. Stay awesome. Stealing that line. Nice. So, yeah, that's that's basically it, right? With the team, we have been also, we want to share this. This is currently a, a, a GitHub repository open for everyone to participate or just to take advantage or gain support. Whatever we are going to continue working on it. Uh, it's it's a fun project. It's a fun thing to do, and it gives it goes a little bit. I mean, uh, what I what I've seen right, and just what you the, what you guys showcased today. I'm amazed. I, I'm so humbled to 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 be here as well, seeing all this amazing stuff. Um, and 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 we we see the opportunity to make something fun, right? To make something a little different. Uh, and and we want to for everyone to take advantage of it. So yeah. Serve yourself and have fun. Yeah, nice. Thank you. And uh, we did include the link to your project in the video description, so you can definitely find it. 
uh, yeah, this this was epic. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing more of, of this kind of projects as well. Nice. Uh, so congratulations, uh, Nesrin, Hokun, uh, Ricardo. This was amazing. Um, me hoping that this will be three, five minute demo was very ambitious, but that's always the case for me. <laughs> but uh, definitely worth the effort, the effort and the time. That was uh, great to see. Um, I just got a weird call from my mom that she needs my banking information. <laughs> Wait, Connor, lock your laptop. <laughs> um, yeah, Mark, Mark is impressed. So this is great, great efforts. Um, yeah, so thank you for your efforts. So next up, uh, now that we're talking about demos, uh, Edward, you when you join, like you joined Vivid recently, maybe even do like a quick intro. Who are you? What uh, what are you doing here? Why are you at Vivid? And what's your demo you want to show? <laughs> okay, no pressure. Before we we start about talking about me, I wanted to try to show the video uh, about the hackathon since we since we're about like since we talked about the hackathon. Yeah, also... do you want to add it to share? Uh, like, the, like um, there you go. Let me play this. What an epic video. We should have opened with it, but I didn't know we could share videos so easily earlier. Hey, live and learn, right? But yeah, that was a really, really nice hackathon. And I'm very proud of you all for the amazing demos you did. And now it's about me. <laughs> so no everyone, pressure. I'm Edward. Um, I actually don't work. I just go to cool events. Uh, I do cool demos and that's it. And today I'd like to show you a cool demo that we've been working on. So we've been we've, we've seen a lot of demos right now, so I'll make it a bit quick. So it's a sneak peek. Yes, voila. So everyone can see my screen. So it's called Health Search, and it's our cool open source demo. It's not public yet, but it will be soon. And the big idea is that you can use this demo to find like supplements uh, for specific health effects based on the user reviews of these products. So you can like we have a cool search bar here and a typical query or something like you would search would be helpful for joint pain. And we can press on generate and we get oh, this is not working, but if it works, let me uh, <laughs> live demos not working. Hey, you gotta lo love a good live demo, hi. Right? <laughs> demo offline. Let, let me just. What is going on? So the backend is fast API. So. Do, are you running it on Docker? Can... Should work now. Give me a moment. Yeah. One sec. Uh, whoop. Refresh. Voila. Hey. Voila. So we get all sorts of products. And the cool thing here is that we get like products where they have like user reviews, specifically speaking about something positive about joint pain. So we can click on 
any product that we see here and get a more detailed look. And we can see here, like it only has two reviews, but it like it talks about joint pain and like a positive effect. And we also made sure that we like annotated or like mark specific uh, keywords. So like um, diseases, symptoms to make it much easier to process what's going on. So we can actually go to something with more reviews. So this is about blood sugar, sleeping, uh, breath, back pain, back pain, knees, joint care and joint pain. And so what we're doing here is semantic search. And the really cool thing about this type of search is that you get that you don't do like this keyword matching exactly so that you don't really look for joint pain and like specifically, but you get results that are like still semantically related to this type of disease. So you have joint health, you have joint care. Um, and yeah, this is a really cool use case because if you would use like traditional search systems, you would miss out many different products. And yeah, I like that there was like a knee pain example there, right? So it's like, yeah, we, like we all know that knees are joints, right? Or, or yes. maybe yes. wrists. Or, or, or like arthritis. Yeah. You would miss that, right? Or arthritis, yeah. Arthritis. So this is, this so, is pretty cool. Um, yeah, and like the big idea behind this is not to really give, like, we don't build this demo to give health advice, but rather really show uh, the power of semantic search. And yeah, so, and before we actually like even retrieve things, there's something cool happening. We do like a natural language translation to GraphQL. So we have uh, a, the, right now, GPT-4 model that like gets into natural language query and then constructs a GraphQL query. And the cool thing about VV8 is that you have different endpoints you can use to actually talk to the database. We have GraphQL, but you can you also have a Pythonic API you can use, or also do everything on TypeScript. Uh, but for this demo, we used GraphQL. And the really exciting thing is now um, it can actually understand. Sorry, my doors my doors ringing ringing. Mm. Is it important? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey, the beauty of live sessions, huh? We go. <laughs> Sebastian, talk about anything. All right, I'll talk about something, right? No, th this is this is super it's cool. It's the FDA like, at the door, isn't it? Is there? Yeah, basically, <laughs> FDA at your door, right? You're arrested, man. You're gone. Uh, this is epic. <laughs> um, that's that's so cool. Like, um, I you see this is like uh, the kind of project that like really show the value. Um, and like having a nice interface, you know, with flashing colors and everything that always uh, helps. Um, but that's yeah, definitely really cool to see. And um, I know that th that's the best thing that like I think uh, Edward built it like within his first week at the, at the company. So um, it's, that's I like this kind of this uh, project, right? Like where you stri straight up hit it big on on week one. Hello. Was it FDA? No, it was just a last package. <laughs> But yeah. So oh, was uh, that your, was that your medicines? My medicine, yeah, that was my supplements I bought. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's a quick, uh, quick delivery. Yeah, <laughs> that's health the health search for you. Okay, no back kidding. to the topic. So you can actually like I choose now products for sleep from the Now Food brand, and it actually could understand what I'm what I like what my goal is. So it added a filter that filters the brand based like on now foods. And now we only get um, products from now food, now foods, or you can also say like best rated product for energy. And it understands your, like what you want and now sorts based on the rating. And this is really cool because you can like really, because in search it's so important to understand what the user wants. And this is a really cool like experimental demo, how you can actually utilize it and then get the products that the user exactly wants. So this is the first thing that, uh, that is happening. Then you do like, then you retrieve all the things, do a semantic search. And now we have something that is very cool, which is called generative search. And maybe you've uh, noticed it, like there's some text coming here. And this is a generated product summary. So another cool thing that VV8 has are the modules, which you can use to enhance your search results. 
and uh, we're using the generate module here specifically. So what it does is it looks at the top five uh, results that you retrieve and it does a product summary on them. And the nice thing is that it's re like referencing your query, like the help of a joint pane. And it's a kind of question answering thing going on here. Uh, but this really makes every search unique. So right now, like based on the query, here's a summary of products, blah, blah, blah. And then it's like names them and tells what is going on there. And we also do that for every product itself. Like we do a review summary. And this way you can really easily get a good sense of what the product is like about and what health effects it might have. So this is this product seems to be effective in relieving joint pain, blah, blah, blah. Or for example, no significant health benefits or effects, effects mentioned. So like it makes information more digestible and it's pretty also, if I, I really like this use case for like generative search because it makes your life easier. And as you've noticed, like these results are coming pretty fast. So of course I'm caching them um, by the scenes, but I'm not using any cache. I'm using Reviate again as cache. And why is this good? Because also natural language queries can be very similar. So you, yet like you can have different wordings, but you mean the same thing. And we don't really want to waste computational power for queries that like that we already already cached, but they're like worded differently. So for example, let's say instead of helpful, let's say good for joint pain. And what happens behind the scenes is, um, yeah, I, I can't, sh can't show it to you because I have this screen, but it first looks uh, if we have a, like a keyword matching, um, like if this query as it is, is already in cache. If not, we're doing like semantic search again. So, uh, and we also, also have like a threshold, a distance threshold. And if we find a query that is semantically similar to ours, we would just retrieve or return the same results as we did for the helpful one. So we can see still like the helpful thing in the concepts, and blah, blah, blah. But if we type in bad for drain pain, I also cache that one, but we get get a different set of results because bad for joint pain is sem semantically completely different than good for joint pain, and I think also like using semantic search as a cache is super interesting. And yeah, so this demo will be open sourced once it's ready, and everyone can like we also host the uh, the demo publicly, and we also want to provide a open source template so that people can just drag and drop their own data set and just have the same stuff going on. Maybe not all features included because this demo is loaded with a lot of features. But yeah, just to like um, jumpstart projects and it already has like we it integrated and you just have to whatever data set you have, because this, like everything I just showed you, you can use it on any data set. You can do talk about wines or bicycles or sweets or teddy bears. Yeah, the uh, possibilities are endless and that's everything. <laughs> Thanks for Excellent. listening. Great demo and a super fast delivery. That was very impressive for sure. Um, <laughs> And there's even a suggestion, you know, maybe we can generate a video for yeah. it, you know, <laughs> like really? a com combine, you know, like a, a throw like a German law book at it, you know, and then even better, Nesreen can like a generate some of the code for you. So at the moment we do GraphQL, but maybe Nesreen's agents can help us generate the Python code or maybe other languages. So, hey, combine the forces between the four of us, four of you, like that would be amazing. So uh, excellent. Thank you for the demo. Great start. So we have two more quick ones uh, to go over. Um, I don't see any more questions. So maybe the next segment, uh, Dan, can you walk us through the WeVate Forum leaderboard? Uh, so that basically ha I have a way to send people t-shirts or maybe some other cool swag. For sure. So uh, our forum has picked up speed since the last time we talked about it on Media Air, and we have a lot of topics in uh, the support category, which is the most popular. 
And here you can see that um, I have a bit of a new design flair. Topics that don't have an answer are colored in this uh, pinkish color. And there is this um, checkbox that's unchecked next to them. Well, solve topics have a checked checkbox. What that means is that the topic has a solution. So if um, our goal is to reduce the number of unsolved topics, we uh, still have some work to do there, but some things are just not so clear cut and there's back and forth. But essentially what happens is every time a topic gets a solution, the user who provided a solution, in this case myself, gets a point. And uh, there is a leaderboard for these users at forum.pv.io slash leaderboard. And that redirects to this uh, users page with different timeframes. So uh, overall, since we launched the forum, JP is number one, congrats. And then we have these um, shorter timeframes with month and quarter. And uh, this is where uh, Sebastian will uh, step in and award some prizes to winners who are outside of our team. So, so, so there's somebody says it's like in the lead for it, for sure. Um, I'm not sure we are voting right now, right now, or, or maybe, you know, hey, it's a good excuse to uh, send somebody a t-shirt already. Um, but yeah, we should probably do it at the end of every month. Uh, check out uh, who's uh, had the biggest comp contribution or if there's several people there. Yeah, let's uh, reward everybody. That's a cool game to play. And uh, JP, if you want to get a free WeV t-shirt, just resign and then continue answering the questions for free. And uh, we'll send you a t-shirt. How's that? That's so weird because I've sent you that email already. I've already quit. So. All right. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Reject it. I am not accepting any of that. Nice. Nice. Um, perfect. Yeah, this is super cool. I, I didn't even know that uh, uh, this course had uh, this feature for, for the leaderboard, but it's really cool to see. You can also see who reads a lot of the posts. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, all of this is public if you go uh, under users and you can sort by all sorts of metrics here. Cool, and then cool. uh, in the support category, there is another way to sort by replies if you want to address topics and perhaps win that checkbox. And you can uh, further filter by what's unsolved. Nice. So take your pick community from here and help us reduce these pink topics. Perfect. Nice. Cool. This is, this was exciting. Um, and thank one you more bit. Yeah. Just one more bit. Um, we had uh, some very interesting demos today, and we'd love to see them in the showcase section whenever they are made public. I saw the running from localhost right now. But if you want to share them in the showcase section, uh, we can also link to your presentation during this live stream, which has been recorded. Oh uh, yeah, so Ricardo, you already have your project on GitHub, right? So you could technically create a mm -hmm. post, maybe even embed a small video or something. Uh, yeah, that'll be cool. You see, you came here and learned something pretty cool. How cool is that? Nice. Thanks for sharing this, Dan. Uh, cool. Fine, and uh, last but not least, um, oh, there is a compliment for Edward. Uh, Edward, this is great. The mathematician in me wants to ask what distance metric. Yeah, I just answered this. It's cos like the default is cosine, but we have uh, a lot of other things that we that are available at least. But I didn't change ten, change the metric like the metric. It's cosine. Cool, cool. I'm also nice. curious how you highlighted uh, those matching uh, words like knee pain as a match for joint pain. That's a good question. So, um, at for my bachelor thesis, I uh, wrote a healthcare NMP pipeline that like extracts uh, diseases and symptoms, but also like positive effects like sleep or mood. And I just reused it. Like I just ran all the reviews on it, and then so that for every review, I got like a list of um, like conditions or uh, symptoms, and I and also like the position, the character position, and I used it to highlight them. So I used my NLP pipeline to like enhance the cool reviews very nice and uh yeah 
And also on the topic of distance metrics, I am going to share it, but we actually have a blog post for it. Uh, if you're anyone's curious, it's like the distance metrics in vector search. Unfortunately, I can't post links in the in the chat. Uh, YouTube just doesn't allow us to share links in there, but uh, we can always add it later in the video description. Perfect. So uh, leaving last or the best for last or however you say it, uh, JP, tell us about Academy because you teased it up in the past, uh, but uh, we finally launched it. So uh, it's now your moment to shine. Yeah, thanks. It's It's been a long gestating topic for sure. I'll keep it brief as well. Um, so we're launching this thing called We Beat Academy. Some of you might have seen it. This is really, really exciting and fun for me. Um, and obviously, like doing vector search and learning about it, it's quite a lot of things you have to learn about. You have to learn about like deep learning, language models, or NN algorithms, or and even just how databases work, right? And it's just a lot. And I was like amazed at how much the hackathon folks had got done within a day. Um, but if you want to sort of um, you know learn about We Beat and all these different topics that are perhaps less of a, like a cauldron of <laughs> high pressure. Um, this is kind of what we at Academy is for. So we did designed it to be more of a holistic course from start to finish. Um, as you'll see, these are arranged into um, names. So these are topics, what we're calling courses. And each course will include multiple, what we call units. So it's like subjects, you know, in the context of like learning units. Um, so you can go through that one by one. It's sequential, so it includes like, video content unfortunately you're gonna to have to see more of my my mug uh, so you may or may not get sick of me um, throughout the throughout the course so there's content with videos and the videos introduce the um the, the concepts as well as exercises you've got um to go through through the um, units and then courses so yeah that's that's kind of what it is and it's designed to, designed to be self-guided and self-paced which should be um sort of you know suitable for anyone learning at any pace and you can skip units if you've seen a lot of this content already. Um, so we've got the 010 BP course launched. Some of you have seen that in the preview phase, but it's now linked from the main website. So under the developer tab, you can click on Academy or you can click on the little, um, I, don't, I never know what this hat is called, um, the academic hat basically. So you can click on that icon to get there. Um, I, th I thought and, that was a ninja star, you know, because you always throw it at people, right? Or that's what I would do. I, I don't personally, you can't prove it. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> that's not me. Um, and, and there's also these like standalone units, which are coming later as well. So we're going to have standalone units on how to select vectorizers and how to deal with media that's not just text and document chunking, which already had questions about earlier today in questions to, you know, Hawkins' um, amazing project as well. So the idea is to guide we get users and kind of like make it easier to learn about all these different technologies and sciences behind the scenes, which is really, really cool. Um, so yeah, please feel free to check it out. Oh, well, I definitely encourage you to check it out and give us um, feedback on what you like, what you don't like and what you want to see because we've got some things in the pipeline that are being recorded and, and prepared. But of course, we'll listen to your feedback about what you want to see more of or we, you know, if you have feedback about the structure as well. Um, so yeah, that's that's me. I'm really excited to see where this goes and to have people on this journey together. Perfect. Thank you, JP. This is super exciting and um, great work. Yeah, great work. And um, you know, you can never have too much of JP's face, right? Like that. So we all what? You know, I'm going on vacation. Literally, this is the last thing I'm going to do uh, until I'm taking like two and a half weeks off. And you know what? I, I may watch a, a cheeky. Uh, one or two of JP videos, you know, just for the fun of it. Like, you know, why not learn something about vector databases? So um, thank you all for watching. Uh, this was an amazing episode with loads of uh, demos. Thank you very much to our special guest, uh, Nesrin Hokun uh, and Ricardo. Uh, welcome all to Edward, Edward. Thanks, JP and Dan. This was amazing. Uh, by the way, if you uh, want to, you know, find us, uh, like, so we shared even LinkedIn uh, uh, profiles for Nesrin, Nesrin, Ricardo, and Hawken, like so you can always uh, find them. Uh, in, uh, so, some of them may be looking for a job, you, you never know. Um, so it, it's, it's great to do that. Like, uh, let us know how you like this episode, drop us some comments. 
Uh, if you, if any of you have something cool to share and show, uh, you, I would like to in, open the invitation. Uh, just like uh, Dan mentioned earlier, you know, like get yourself on that leaderboard. Maybe you can help us out and one of those cool t-shirts or maybe even a better one. Uh, so yeah, we already see like some uh, people excited about the episode. Jürgen's going to be back. That's great to hear. And uh, great team. Uh, well, great job team from Erica. This is actually the first episode that Erica didn't uh, participate in. So, uh, but it's good that uh, we we had her, you know, at least uh, you know somewhere in the spirit. So that's good to uh, to see. So these are my final words. Uh, thank you all for your time, and then see you next time. Let's do that. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. bye.